really exciting to be here today addressing the National Sexuality Education Conference. Um, I've been coming to this conference for about five years now. And it is absolutely one of my favorite places to go. It's a safe space. It's a brave space where we can really come together and learn. I've met some amazing folks here. I've uh, taught um, several exciting workshops and learned new things. Even just yesterday, for example, my thinking about how we use the word healthy was really stretched in Sana Lee's workshop. So um, I'm thinking about that one, and I hope that you all are too. Um, you're going to hear me use it today, but that's because it's part of my, um, my language that I've been using for so long, but I'm thinking about it. And I hope that we're going to keep thinking about it. So, I think that this is such a great opportunity to be thinking about what do we as sexuality educators do to really bring in intentional learning environments and how do we talk about this really challenging subject, consent. It's something that I've been thinking a lot about um, and I imagine that you all have too. So today during my keynote, I'm going to be talking about how the national discourse is really focused on simple messages about how consent is simple. However, in reality, it's also very complicated. There are a lot of different parts that go into consent. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what do we as sexuality educators do about it all. So before we jump into consent, I do want to take a moment and encourage you all to practice self-care. Do what you need to do throughout this presentation, whether that means take a breath, maybe um, twiddle your thumbs, Possibly you're welcome to search, search your cell phone. It's definitely okay, but do what you need to do because we know that this topic can be challenging. It can be sensitive. It can bring up issues and thoughts and ideas and feelings. We really want you to do what you need to do. So a couple things that I do for my self-care is I always make sure I have chocolate close by, accessible. Um, sometimes there's a stuffed animal that can help me smile. Um, and you might be doodling. There's a card there um, that's a breathing exercise. Um, and of course, you've got your notepads and your cell phones. So really just do what you need to do. So look back to 2010. That was that first year that I attended the sex ed conference. If you do a Google search for consent education in quotes, during the year 2010, you kind of give that time limit. How many news results do you feel like came up? Any guesses? 200? 8 million. 8 million? 20? I think I heard the answer out there. It's absolutely zero. Zero results in 2010, only five years ago, for this topic of consent education. So fast forward to 2015, and what do you have? but more than can show up on a page, certainly more than the 10 pages that Google allows you at the end, which means that consent education, educating people about consent is now a thing. It's something that the world is paying attention to. It's part of the national dialogue. And isn't that amazing? I mean, we now have a conversation. This discourse is happening. So much so that if you look into news sources from the last few weeks, I imagine you'd be hard pressed to not find an article in, about consent in our major news sources. People are really talking about it all the time and showing up in our TV shows. We've got folks um, on campuses, campus sexual assault. We're talking about affirmative consent. So much dialogue is happening in, about consent around the, around the world, um, especially in the United States. We've got a lot of national and local campaigns that are coming up. We've got It's On Us, that national campaign. It's bringing awareness and con about consent to our le a new level of consciousness. It's engaging celebrities in the message. We've got um, sports teams that are uh, taking a stab at making consent part of their mantra. They're making this a topic not to be ignored or overlooked. And people, not just sexuality educators or violence prevention experts, are talking about consent, writing about it, making videos. You've got Lacey Green, who I know is speaking later today. Um, BuzzFeed features things about consent on a regular basis. You've got um, porn stars making videos about consent. The ubiquity of the coverage is helping the message get to people and places that may not have heard or seen these messages before. We've got memes that are bringing consent to our consciousness on new levels. 
This is a topic not just for the niche industry anymore. It's now a message for everybody, including politicians. For better or worse, legislators are tackling consent. And yes, tackling. Because if we need something done in the legislature, we have to fight campus sexual assault. We have to combat intimate partner violence. We have to tackle consent, like my violent language to reduce violence. States like California, New York, and most likely soon to have other states following in their path are passing state laws. They're adding on to federal legislation like Title IX, Cleary, Campus Save, VAWA, and so on. So what does this mean? Folks are fired up about consent. People are thinking about it, writing about it, talking about it more than ever. It comes up in social situations. I overhear people talking about it on the train. My Facebook feed, which, yes, is geared towards sexuality educator me, is flooded with posts about consent, but often from my peer group that's not sexuality educators, my friends from college when I studied music. Sometimes it could be hard not to talk about consent. You actually kind of want to go home from your day. I've been talking about it a lot at work, and then it comes up. And sometimes we do have to let people know that you're going to have to take a break from the conversation sometimes. So rock on. It is so exciting that consent is finally getting the attention that it deserves. But let's check in about the messages that are dominating this conversation. And what do we as sexuality educators do with those messages? How do we engage participants in meaningful, productive learning about consent? So what are those prevailing messages dominating this conversation? We hear things like, consent is sexy. Yes means yes, no means no. My dress is not a yes. Thank you, Lindsay Fram. Yes, always, got consent. Consent is mandatory. We hear all these slogans really focusing on this idea that consent is simple and packaged in very simplistic ways. So I'd like to share with you a story about my aha moment when I realized that we can package and think about consent as this everyday, straightforward thing that if we can really practice it in everyday situations, then maybe those skills of thinking about consent all the time will translate to when we're thinking about consent when we're having sexual activity. So how many people here have ever had a roommate? Raise of hands, had a roommate. Okay, great, so the bulk of us, right? Many of us have ever had a roommate. Okay, so I invite you to raise your hand if you've ever had a roommate that ate your food without asking. Okay, right? Okay, so also many of us, right? So I had a roommate like that once, who for years was eating my food without asking. My special granola, my snack food, and I really tried to not make a big deal out of it. I'm from the South and, you know, learned the manner, good manners, you know, that sharing is a really big virtue. Um, and I would tell my roommate, you know, hey, just ask. It's probably going to be OK, but please ask. So one time, I was in the other room, and I wandered into the kitchen. And what did I find but my roommate eating my food, right, in the other room. And this wasn't just food that I had purchased. This was food that I had prepared. This was a meal. I was looking forward to the leftovers. Let me tell you. I was absolutely livid, I'm livid. I don't really get angry that often, if you know me. I was livid. And I stormed out of the apartment. I was like, I can't be in the same space with you, that you just disrespected me. You yet again failed to ask for my permission. I felt like my food was no longer safe. I started shopping differently. I started hiding my food in discreet places. This all sounds familiar probably to many. I did not trust my roommate to ask for my consent. I was angry. And what does anger mean? It means that we need to change something. Something needs to change. I wanted my roommate to change their everyday behaviors. That when my roommate went into the kitchen, saw food that was not theirs, they would ask. So it's very simple, right? In my mind, very simple, just ask. But it's hard to change an everyday behavior. It's hard to change a habit that had been going on for years and years. It's hard to you know, change those habits. I've been trying for 20 years to stop snoozing. 
And I still, it's really hard. So this was my aha moment of, about consent. That if we could think about this every day, right? I was uh, speaking with Lorena last night, and it's also like learning a language. When it becomes, um, we're talking about learning Spanish. When you start thinking about it all the time, you don't have to think about it. It's just part of your daily practice. You know, you can easily switch. You know, it's just your mantra, your everyday thing. Then it's second nature, it's that habit. So we can help young people think about consent as just a habit, as everyday consent. So I'm gonna encourage you all, I'm gonna throw a hashtag out there, everyday consent. How can we be helping the community at large, maybe this is a small community you work with, maybe this is the you know, broader community, help them understand that if we practice these behaviors every day, then they'll translate to situations when there's sexuality ha happening. So why do we focus so much on simple messages, these simplistic, consent is simple things? We do want young people to understand the definition of consent, that it's ongoing, it can be withdrawn, that it's not you know, consent once, doesn't mean consent all the time. These are some of the things that we want to be focusing on. Educators, professionals, communications teams are really gravitating towards this message that consent is simple to help them focus on those things, to make it concrete, to make it actionable. And to be honest, students are hungry for these messages. They want clear messages of what to say, when to say it, with whom, in what context. They want easy answers to this question of how do I have sex and not have sexual violence take place? They're really looking for these answers. As the dialogue around campus sexual assault has increased, many young people are concerned. They, they really are concerned that they're gonna do something wrong, that they're gonna get in trouble. They haven't had a ton of opportunities to actually talk about talking about sex. They lack the language, the simple words, the phrases, the guidance on that clear communication, both verbal and nonverbal. They might be relying on information gleaned from their peers, from family members, their culture, their religion, blog posts, videos, books, Fifty Shades of Grey, pornography. They might lack positive role models demonstrating healthy communication skills. And many young people do want programs on consent. They want their educational opportunities to be talking about this. And not just consent, but enthusiastic consent. How do I express enthusiasm with this um, topic? They want that concrete guidance, those step-by-step -step simple instructions. So one example of how much people appreciate this approach, that consent is simple, is the blog post, Consent Not Actually That Complicated, posted by Emmeline May earlier this year on her blog, Rockstar Dinosaur Pirate Princess. Many of you all probably read this blog post when it came out, and then a few months later, there was a video released about consent as tea. So this post, is a great example of how things can go viral. And I'm not talking about viral, I'm talking actually about super viral. I mean, like, I have no idea how many times people posted this on my page. Yeah, I see some nods in the room. Or maybe they tagged, it, a po tagged me in the post about it. Or, you know, mentioned it to me in conversation. They're like, Kirsten, have you seen this video? Right, they love it. You know, it's just going viral. This is getting the message out there. So I do know that um, a lot of people have probably seen this before, but to really bring this idea, these ideas emphasize that consent is not actually that complicated, which is the title of her post, um, I'm gonna uh, invite you all to watch it here now. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, yes, I would love a cup of tea, thank you then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? 
they might say, yes, please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. <laughs> right. So this video, as you might know, is very well received. Students love this video. And I know that there's also f some folks out there who have um, shared some very critical thoughts around this video. I'd be happy to chat with you later about it. Um, but just we need to be aware that folks love this. It's resonating. This is reaching people. Just a few weeks ago, I heard a graduate student say in a small group meeting that this was the most effective way that he had ever learned about consent. This is probably a guy in his mid-20s. The most effective way. So we need to be aware of the fact that this is what people are considering to be effective and engaging. And to some degree, it is. To some degree, right? So we also have other videos out there. We have more than just the Consent is Tea video series, um, or vi videos. So we've got PPFA's video series, which I do want to highlight because it's a, not just one video depicting one situation with clear-cut answers. It's quite a few videos. So I want to just um, shout out to PPFA. They have an ex exhibition table they, where you can watch the videos. We don't have, unfortunately, enough time to watch them all here. Um, but say hi to my friend Julia, who's at that PPFA um, exhibition table, and take a look at their series, which is focusing on you know, not just how do you recognize consent in one scenario, but you know, if there's different types of relationships with different um, uh, configurations of partners. So I also want to raise that we need to be mindful that simplifying consent can have its drawbacks. There are some folks that struggle with these messages. For example, some people are frustrated and annoyed that they have to participate in consent education in the first place. That in their minds, it's not a big deal. Everyone knows about consent. It's basic, straightforward, so don't waste my time. So George Lawler in the United Kingdom has gained a lot of attention for his resistance to consent education, um, saying, you know, I'm not a rapist, so why do I need to learn about consent? And this is challenging, right? For us as sexuality educators, I imagine the many of you all in the room share this idea, you're like, oh, I wonder if this person needs it more than the next guy, right? That we need to be reaching people even who don't want to be reached, which is, I feel like, one of our hardest challenges. I don't have the answer. I'd like for us to you know, keep on talking about that. Let's think about that. That's a critical thinking moment. So not everyone is in this camp. As I said before, there are folks that are hungry for these consent education programs. But we do need to be mindful that by oversimplifying consent, we might lose people to this notion that they don't need it. And speaking of pushback, there's a contingent of folks that also really only want to hear this message that consent is essential. 
and they don't want us to be using this phrase, consensual sex, because if it's not consensual, then it's rape, which is true, yes. At the same time, we also want to be mindful that hearing the term rape can be challenging for some. It can be, put, be off-putting. Some people that have experienced sexual activity without consent may not think of their experience as rape. They don't use that language, which is 100% OK. There are lots of ways to think about these issues, lots of behaviors that fall in this broader umbrella of sexual and intimate partner violence besides forced penetration. But thinking about this term, this phrase consensual sex, it has great intentions. I'm sure that I've used it in many different ways. Because it brings to the forefront of our minds consent. You know, it's attaching consent to, to sex and to sexual activity. But we do, do need to be mindful, again, that it could be shutting some folks down, that they may no longer be engaging in the conversation because there's that resistance to this phrase. On a related tangent, there's often criticism of the popular message that consent is sexy. And this argument it, is that it minimizes the issue, that consent is actually a very serious topic, and that by emphasizing sexy, it takes away the focus that should be on preventing sexual violence. And some folks are also, also argue, which I think is very valid, that consent may actually not be sexy at all. It could be awkward or uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean that we skip those steps. That even if it's not sexy, then we still need to, to be mindful of consent. And this could be particularly frustrating for sexuality educators interested in bringing in this idea of sex positivity that want to emphasize that consent can contribute to the sexy times being fun and pleasurable. Um, and I'll admit that that's one of my perspectives, that's one of my frameworks that I bring to this work in sexual violence prevention, that if we can help folks understand pleasure and good things, that that will help them understand sexuality as a whole and, and consent. You know, that is part of my framework. So these are, this is a struggling moment for me. This is a, a growing edge, is how do we message around consent and sexy and essential and preventing sexual violence all at the same time? So these are some of the things that we need to be thinking about as a field. So what, is, what do we do with this idea? These simplistic messages that uh, consent is simple. The fact is we need them. We need to have these frameworks, the, these snapshots, these slogans. It makes the concept approachable. It helps young people feel empowered in their decision making. It's easy to remember that way and hopefully act on. And they make great t-shirts and posters. These checklists can help folks keep in mind key factors involved, sobriety, clarity, enthusiasm, lack of coercion, communication, Messages that help young people ask themselves the right questions, help them look out for verbal and nonverbal cues that someone's not comfortable, they're not able to give consent, they're not into it. Messages that give concrete phrases to use like, do you want me to? We can articulate to young people in these simple, concrete ways what consent is and is not. We can do this from a young age. We know that middle school and high school students can learn about consent and relationships so that as they gain experience, they can add on to that foundation. Building on that, we can be talking about consent with young children. You know, if we talk and model consent either explicitly or implicitly with our young children, then they're ev going to be even more prepared. You know, so if our, our little kid doesn't want to hug grandma, then we can say that's okay, you don't have to hug grandma. It's a lifelong skill, and we can be helping young children, adolescents, young adults, adults, older adults, all think about and practice this idea around consent. So to really hone in on what these messages are that fall in the category, maybe it's something I've said, maybe it was in the video, maybe it's something that we haven't mentioned just yet, I'd like to invite you to work either independently or with the other folks at your table, and you're gonna see a stack of little note cards and then a couple pens and write down a message on this card about consent is simple. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll invite you to post it on one of the posters in the back so that we can collectively come up with some of these messages that consent is simple. And while you're at it, I also invite you to chat about how will you use these simple messages about consent when you leave the conference today. So take about 
90 seconds, not too long, because these are simple, and do that together. All right, so thank you for taking that moment to think about consent as simple messages. Let's shift this conversation. Y'all ready to get complicated? Yeah? Okay, good. So my own first real thinking about consent as a professional in the field was admittedly in this context of an avenue to more pleasurable experiences. That explicit consent makes everyone feel more comfortable, therefore more into it. You can, I know I touched on that earlier. That was my framework that I was bringing to this conversation, despite being in the midst of a very important dating violence prevention program at the mayor's office. But in my mind, it was all about how can we help folks feel more comfortable, and consent's gonna make, be a big part of that. It wasn't this violence prevention message, this perspective that by talking about consent, you're eliminating violence. Um, so it's complicated. There's so many different ways to be thinking about the framework of consent. So let's think back to my roommate who ate my food without asking. And these are my biscuits. As I mentioned, in my mind, it was simple. Don't eat my food without asking. Like, that's pretty straightforward. My roommate and I, though, we had a relationship, not a sexual relationship, but a relationship nonetheless. And you're going to hear me use this word relationship. I encourage you to think about many types of relationships, not just committed, long-term, intimate partnerships, but friendships, family members, roommate arrangements. You know, lots of relationships can benefit from this idea about consent. We had family meals, though. We had this relationship where we shared some food, but not all, which makes it a kind of complicated, right? We had shared joys and concerns and sorrows. We had this great friend group that we'd eat meals together. So if we had never shared food, if we had a different kind of relationship in our roommate, in our household, where we were just living in the same space, how likely would it have been that my roommate would have eaten my food without asking? I feel, my guess is, I didn't do the research, that the likelihood would go down if the, you don't have as strong as a relationship. So what if I didn't know this person at all and I'm sitting at a coffee shop and eating a biscuit, how likely would it be that some stranger would just come over and take my biscuit? Not as likely because we had that, that relationship. It impacts our attitudes about others, our behaviors that are acceptable or not. The idea that since I know this person in this way, it's okay if I skip these ask for consent steps. And why didn't my roommate ask? Did my roommate just not think? Was my roommate being really selfish? Possible. But maybe my roommate was afraid to hear no was afraid that I was going to say, was like, oh, well, if I ask Kirsten, then you know that it's this her special meal, and she's going to say no, and so just went for it. Conflicts and disagreements have weight in different ways when you're in relationship with someone. Somebody might avoid conflict because they've observed someone reacting poorly in other situations. Or they might be thinking, well, why bother saying anything at all? It's not going to change anything. My mom likes to say, behaviors are patterned and predictable. It's that mantra in my back of my mind. And then you've got other factors. What are the other relationships involved that impact ours? What's our life situation? For me, I couldn't just kick my roommate out, which is something you all might be thinking if it's so long. I couldn't. It was just not really a possibility. And remember, all I'm talking about here is food. Relationships add deep layers to human interactions and especially sexual interactions. How do people know each other? How long? Who's in their network? What's happened before? What are the expectations they, the next time they see each other, if at all? How comfortable are they disagreeing? How do they handle discomfort or rejection? How safe does the relationship feel? What are the cultural expectations? and components coming into that relationship. Young people are often not equipped to handle rejection or communicate about discomfort if they're uneasy or undecided. And not just young people, sometimes we are uncomfortable with these things. 
rarely have they had opportunities to truly explore these issues, to get guidance on ways to handle communication about consent, to talk openly about sex. Maybe they've talked about it with their friends, but peers aren't always the most reliable of resources. Although, shout out to all those peer ed programs, because I think that's one of the big ways that we're making a difference in this world, right? That's right. Maybe some folks have had some sex ed, but a lot of programs focus on sexual health and reproduction, like anatomy, infection, pregnancy. A lot of programs are focusing on abstinence until marriage as one of the only focuses. They need also, though, to practice negotiating consent, to talk about sex, how to deal with rejection, how to have a breakup respectfully, how to make decisions about sexual activity, how to communicate verbally and non-verbally. Because consent really boils down to communication, and that's the simple message, right? So we hear that a lot. Oh, it's just about communicating verbally and non-verbally. But we're talking about communicating about something that is still very uncomfortable for many to express, discuss, or even do. Yes, it's 2015, soon to be 16, and sexuality is becoming something more people feel okay talking about, but there's still a lot of anxiety and shame surrounding sex, which can make it hard for people to communicate about. And maybe it's hard to talk about because our culture is not doing us any favors with healthy approaches to sexual consent. We live in a culture in the United States that has made sex analogous to many things, but really it's all about the win. And none of them center around consent, not, at least not the dominating ones. So a few examples of how sex is like a win. It's a game, like baseball. The goal is to win, and to do that, you have to play. You play hardball, you play hard to get, you're always looking to score. And shout out to Al Vernacchio for helping illuminate the pitfalls of the baseball analogy, right? Check out his TED Talk and his book. I imagine it's for sale here, yes. So um, really an important look at how we think about baseball analogy for sex. What happens to consent in a game? Is it just about asking if you want to play at the beginning? What happens if you want to stop in the middle? Or you only want to play a little bit of the game? Or you want to play an entirely different game? Another way that we think about sex is like a fight. It's banging, smashing, you go hit that. I mean, what's the phrase that we use when we talk about someone experiencing the sexual advances of another? Anybody got that in the? You get hit on. Where does that come from? You get hit, I mean, like, it's just everywhere. It's pervasive. The way that we talk about sex as so violent, it makes it sound like war, not pleasure or fun. And many may say, oh, well, I'm not actually going to hit them, at least not without their consent. But this language normalizes violence, that you're setting up an approach, a mindset that from the jump, you are talking about violence. It's about violence, not those pleasurable experiences. We think about sex like a ploy. It's about convincing the other person to do it, getting them to say yes, tricking them into thinking it's something that they want, getting buddies to back you up, weakening them by giving them alcohol or other substances. I'm going to talk more about alcohol later. Um, if they say no, try, try, try again. These are all great examples of coercive behaviors. And in many ways, this is how we're taught to start a relationship, to show interest in someone. This is part of our dialogue, our narrative. Lastly, it's a race because it's about how fast you can get someone to have sex with you, or how long can you hold out until they split, or who among a group of friends will be the first to have sex? Who can get their partner to give in first? And the end justifies the means, whatever it takes, even if that means skipping the consent steps. Nothing in these models encourages someone to be thinking about negotiation, listening, hearing authentically, watching for nonverbal cues, being open to anything beyond win. And winning is about penetrative sex. These models counter the message that healthy relationships have honesty, equality, respect, responsibility based on consent. And remember, relationships of any length, 
seriousness or commitment. And there are certainly many of us that don't buy into these ways of thinking about sex, hopefully lots of us here in the room like me, but if you're awake and not living in a cave in a forest, you're seeing and hearing these ideas. Whether you like it or not, these models can sneak into our existence. We need models that are based on consent. But it's hard, to, it's hard to do that when so much surrounds us that tells us otherwise. For example, music practically gives us a step-by-step -step guide to coercive behaviors. With as much time and energy that people give music in their lives, we have got to consider its influence on how we think about what music is most often about, sex, love, relationships, heartbreak. We do need to give young people and people in general opportunities to reflect on the messages that music focuses on, help them develop media intelligence so they're able to recognize that what's described in many songs is not healthy or based on consent models. Our movies and our TV shows show us tropes that outline relationship trajectories that reinforce coercive behaviors or encourage folks to play hard to get or set people up for unrealistic expectations. And I do want to note that I found a lot of these um, images by Googling things like romantic comedies, and I have noted the uh, lack of diversity in these, uh, these shows. So we're also thinking about what's our, um, our media diet. Yes, another thing from Sana Lee's workshop yesterday that was so great. It's complicated with so many messages about how to get some or how you shouldn't let someone take advantage of you, big air quotes there. We need to provide opportunities to help folks recognize what's going on around us in our culture. We need those consent models to help folks understand it. And I'm pretty biased against these winning models, so what are a few alternative approaches that if we talk more about, maybe these will catch on instead? Things like Al Vernacchio's pizza model. Where sex is like a pizza, you discuss it ahead of time, you select toppings together, you go over the preferences, come to this shared decision about what will be most delicious. So maybe we can shift our thinking. Instead of winning, we're about sharing. In this model, people are encouraged to think about sharing it, what people like and dislike, and there's so many ways to experience pizza. And the success is in the deliciousness of the experience, not the winning or scoring or defeating of someone. Another model that I like is Karen B. Chan's jam session, which also centers around consent, that you bring to the table all the tools and the skills that you have as a musician. You've got to practice. Innovation is invited. The point of jamming is to find out what happens and to enjoy the process while you're tuning in to others, your mind, your body. Definitely check out Karen B. Chan and Al Vernacchio's models. And a common theme in all those winning approaches, the game, the fight, the ploy, the race, is that one person is really trying to exert power over another. Power. We've all got some, but by golly, there almost always is someone out there that's got a little bit more. And it's complicated because people aren't always aware of the power they have or how people will react because of that power or how someone might not act because of someone else's power. Or maybe they're fully aware of their power and they're just going for the win, whatever it takes. Power is a significant underestimated influence on sexual relationships. Someone's power over another influences the other person's agency to act or speak out on their own behalf. A few examples. So someone might have power over another because of their social status. They're well-known, they're popular, well-liked, which means that if someone were to engage in sexual activity with that person, they might not feel they can say no or ask someone to stop or express discomfort because if they did, that person with the power could use their social power against them. Someone might have power because they're out to the community about their sexual orientation and their partner is not. And that could create a situation where the person who is not out feels obligated to do whatever their out partner wants. One person might feel in debt to another because their partner paid their cell phone bill or took them out to dinner, bought them drinks, spent time with them, and someone could use that power to convince or force someone to have sex, to stay in a relationship, and so on. 
These are just examples, ways that someone could use power over someone else, and ways someone could feel powerless when with someone. And there's so many more examples, there really isn't enough time in the day to cover them all. But by teaching folks to understand or at least think about the complicated dynamics of power and how they could play out in a relationship, it will help them develop healthier approaches to relationships, again, no matter the length or commitment, where folks feel comfortable, feel safe, feel heard, respected, and ultimately based on consent. We need to help folks recognize power because behaviors that can be controlling in nature, both in others and in themselves, I like to communicate the message that we can all check ourselves to see if the urge for control is what's driving what we're doing. It's pervasive. We're encouraged to keep our partners on lockdown. If you're in a relationship, then you're cuffed. And if you're doing something that your partner asked you to, you're whipped, right? The way we see relationships is about controlling our partners. We can also help folks be mindful of other people's vulnerability, considering another person's agency, their ability to act on their own behalf. And power doesn't go away, but how you deal with it, how you treat someone, how you use power or not, that's what matters. And it's tough, not easy at all, which is why folks need chances to think deeply and critically about it. We also have to help people put societal influences together with or tell them apart from their own identities. So that's me. For example, how I see the world and relationships and sex will be different from the next white girl with brown hair and freckles from Virginia. Who we are, where we come from, what gives our life meaning and our culture, our background, that all fits together and are huge parts of our relationships. For example, for me, sharing a meal is a really important part of who I am and how I share my time with others. And believe me, I won the jackpot. Oh, see, there's no winning reference. And I met somebody who is a phenomenal cook and shows his love by cooking me food. And you all might have similar ideas about sharing a meal and the value that that has, but you can't necessarily know that at first glance. You'd have to get to know us first, right? That's just me, and it's just a snippet. And how I see relationships in my own life, we've all got our own lenses that we put on. And who we are also ties into privilege. What advantages someone might have because of their identity. Myself, being a young, able-bodied, cisgender, white person who's heterosexual with a master's degree in sexuality and health, gives me a healthy dose of privilege when it comes to understanding power, consent, and healthy relationships. And I'm constantly reminding myself to step outside my box and to seek to learn more about other perspectives, other examples, and I really invite you all to do the same. We're all made up of many different identities, more identities than we can realize, and many that are not always apparent. And many identities are associated with systems of oppression. For example, women may face barriers that men don't, transgender individuals face barriers that cisgender people don't, and people of any race besides white face barriers that white people don't. And if someone has more than one identity associated with that system of oppression, that's this conversation around intersectionality. So food for thought, I think. If someone is oppressed or disadvantaged, how might that impact their agency to consent? Right? That's a, it's a big one. Then add on additional oppressions and what happens? This is a complicated topic with very few simple messages or easy answers. On a side note, um, I was writing this lesson plan on intersectionality for unequal partners, and I was thinking deeply about this. It was kind of you know, a new area of, of learning for me. Um, and I was going around thinking about what are the discussion questions that I can put into this lesson so that people can help think about this more deeply. Going through my daily habits, because I had to get out the door, so I was in the shower, and I come out of the shower in my towel, and my fiance's in the apartment, you know, doing his own thing, um, and he's folding laundry. And all of a sudden, I just blurt out, what do we do about multiple systems of oppression? 
my, my fiance was totally baffled, as am I. It's complicated. I mean, we could have an entire keynote on intersectionality, hint, hint. There are some amazing folks doing a lot of work on this topic, like we saw. We have many of them here today. I'm thrilled that we opened this conference talking about racial justice and having that session on Wednesday night. So while I'm not digging in deep right now, I, have to, I had to put it on the radar. We can't ignore that consent is impacted by power, privilege, oppression, and how all of those work together. Because to have healthy relationships, we need to be mindful of it all. So before winding the conversation about consent being complicated down, I have got to talk about alcohol. For just a minute, though. It's a topic that gets a lot of airspace when consent comes up, but rarely is the conversation focused on the complicated. We tend to simplify these messages. Um, just like this image says, alcohol doesn't cause consent to be violated. It's not the root cause, but it does play a part. It is part of the dialogue. The simple messages, though, are so much easier. I have given so many simple messages in response to tricky questions when I get them from students. We lean away from complicating this one. But it really is. Talking about consent and alcohol authentically, responsibly, being able to truly hear participants and help them navigate this in real life within the parameters of your institution, it's one of my growing edges, and it might be one of yours, too. I mean, alcohol affects everyone differently, and sometimes alcohol affects the same person differently on two different days. There's no hard and fast rule with how many drinks is too many to not be able to consent. Students ask this question, how much is too much? All the time. We can provide them with guidelines, but in reality, it can be hard to accurately judge someone else's level of intoxication, not to mention your own. And the response that I, again, have given many times, well, if you're just not sure, wait till tomorrow. I give that message on a regular basis. It doesn't always land well with participants, maybe because that's a simple response to a very complicated issue. Alcohol is very deeply cultural. Someone drinking may be going with or against their culture of origin. And alcohol is a big part of our dating and relationship culture, right? If you go out on a date for the first time, you're often going to get a drink. I met my fiance at a bar, and we're doing okay. Relationships, you often acknowledge accomplishments and achievements, and you know, landmarks in your relationships with alcohol, like you know, anniversaries or in engagement or weddings often have alcohol involved, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's just part of our culture. We also know that alcohol is used to manipulate someone, to make them more likely to, or susceptible to having sex, to get someone wasted as a strategy to win at sex. It's something that we've been taught and it's reinforced in our media. Take a look at this beer bottle from Bud Light, telling us to remove no from our vocabulary. Now, this bottle didn't last long on the shelves, among criticism, and rightly so, that encouraged coercive behaviors, demises consent, and contributes to rape culture. However, it also highlights that we might use alcohol or other substances to lower our own inhibitions, to feel comfortable doing things that we might not have otherwise. We need to be helping young people and people examine the culture of alcohol and substance use, understand the impact of alcohol and substances, recognize coercive behaviors, identify ways to help someone else, and make healthier decisions about alcohol and substance use for their own selves. How can they do it with their own values in mind? So we get to do this uh, activity again, and this one might be a little bit harder. Admittedly, the complicated section was harder for me to put together. So I invite you to turn back to your neighbors, chat together or work independently, and write down that message of what is consent being complicated. What are the things that we need to do to make it complicated? So take a few minutes, and then um, I'll bring you back. So when we think about simple and we think about complicated, I apologize for not having you all have that, have that time. Um, ultimately, we need both. 
Right? We, need both simple, we, we need both simple and complicated. We can have those messages in and out of learning environments. And we absolutely need to have those intentional lessons on the complexity of consent. And we also need to integrate the ideas of consent into our other lessons on sexual health. Things like condom negotiation, infection, sexual health, great places to include consent. And you might be asking, how do I do this? Well, one of the tools that you can have in your toolbox is, of course, my shameless plug for Unequal Partners. You can pre-order your copy today, and it will be in print in early 2016. I'm really thrilled to have been in this role as an editor for Unequal Partners. Been a lot of the themes that I've been talking about today, there are lesson plans that address those themes. Um, there's a, a volume for young and middle adolescents, and there's a volume for college-age students. And Really, it's designed as a manual where you can go and find what you need to use with your group and then um, take it and put it together as it works for you. There are several lesson plans on consent in each volume and many ways to approach the subject from both simple and complicated perspectives. Because consent, it can't just be one time. This is something that needs to be explored over and over again over time. Consent is a skill. Just like any skill, if it's not practiced, there's no way that we're going to get better. It's like cooking. You can't just cook one dish one time and then know how to cook everything. We need many opportunities to think critically about consent. And another thing, it takes a lot longer than 30 minutes to, talk, to learn about consent, especially if you're going to get to those complicated natures and the nuances and have it in a culturally appropriate way that resonates with your audience. Teaching about consent is hard. And people might think it's easy because they focus on the simple messages, but facilitators need to be ready for the complicated, for the topic deeply affecting participants. Because it matters who's teaching. It matters what perspectives they bring. It matters how much understanding they have of not just sexuality, but sexual and intimate partner violence. It matters how they talk to the group, how they handle pushback, how they respond to participants that are grappling with a truly complicated subject. Participants want to be heard. They want their questions answered and the concerns addressed. They want to feel included in the conversation, feel like they can see and hear themselves as part of the narrative. And they definitely don't want to be talked down to or ostracized. And we need facilitators that are willing to listen and respect those participants. It matters how you do it. So how is the program structured? It, is it mandatory? How are we setting things up if we have a mandatory required forced uh, program about something that is helping folks understand agency and consent? Is the program being implemented just to check a box because your participants are going to know? And is the program interactive? How many participants have you got talking about a difficult subject? Because if you're sitting among a group of 500 people, it's hard to get really into what, what is uh, the, the issue at hand. And it matters where the program is happening. Who's the hosting institution or department? What's the climate in which the program is happening? And what's your space like? Do you have folks sitting in really uncomfortable chairs to talk about something that's really sensitive? And it matters how the participants walk into the room. Are they bringing in stuff that's going to derail the conversation? Are they walking in ready to think deeply? Or are they just there to pick a fight? These things matter, and we've got to remember that. So I hope that you'll take some of these messages back to your home institutions. All this leads me to say that we need a trauma-informed approach to consent. Participants have strong feelings about the topic, especially now amidst all the attention that's getting. Given the high rates of violence, it's likely that your participants will have had at least some experience related to violations of consent, either themselves or someone they know. We need to be extra mindful and intentional when inviting participants to share. Consider asking participants to use the third person or to use examples from the media instead of asking their own personal experiences. And if you've created the space, which I know many of you sexuality educators, that's also your jam, those brave spaces, expect disclosures. Be ready and know how you'll respond, both empathetically and with referrals, when someone comes forward in the middle of a program, after, or even three months down the line. Because how we respond to someone that's experienced sexual assault or a violation of consent, that's going to influence their, how they are able to move on in their life. So we also need to make sure that we 
um, practice self-care. We emphasize it with our participants, let them know that it's important to be thinking about before, middle, and after our program, and also practice self-care yourself. Something that we need to be aware of that vicarious trauma is real. One resource that has really helped me lately is a book called Trauma Stewardship. I encourage you all to check it out because lots of time of thinking about how to help others can really take a toll. So how do we put this together? We need to use the simple messages. They're great on posters. They're great hashtags. They're great in a meme or in a social media campaign, a PSA. They make great workshop and activity titles. But we've got to have those opportunities to follow up simple messages with complexity of consent. Maybe in formal workshop, maybe it's a writing assignment, maybe it's an art project, maybe it's all of these ways together, and do it more than once. There's no way that young people can learn about it all in one session. I mean, I've barely touched on everything um, that is related with consent, one topic being gender. There's an entire workshop and keynote on gender and consent. So my hope is that you'll lean into the complicated, tease out those nuances, sit with the complex. And because if we leave the conversation at consent is simple, we're doing a disservice to our participants. We need the balance with a little bit more emphasis on complicated. So my closing question to you is to talk about on your way out is how will you integrate consent into your program, balancing that simple complicated dynamic in a trauma-informed way. Thank you all very much.